Uh, and with our completion of Ephesians, we've actually gone through every New Testament book since I've been here as a Bible study. Um, but Philemon was one we did a long time ago, like probably close to 20 years ago. And it, um, it ties in with some of our discussion from Ephesians, so I thought we would go through that. At the end of it, you see, uh, you see very last bit there on page three, possible topics for study this summer. Uh, if anyone has anything you would like to uh, discuss, we have a summer we could do something with. So if you have some suggestions, write that down and just put your Bible class back there and I'll look at it uh, sometime during the week. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we're open to whatever this summer. Okay, Philemon. It is, right before Hebrews, smallest book in the New Testament, right after Timothy and Titus. You'll want to find it. Page 1034 for some of you people who I can't find it. All right. It is written as a dispute between a slave and a slave owner, and that's why it's particularly apropos for our study of Ephesians. Anytime we talk of, uh, of morality, of roles, uh, especially the whole sexual thing, which Ephesians did discuss a lot of, uh, we get into the, the, the accusation of the Christian view of slavery as an excuse to ignore it all. Because Christians evidently don't have a problem with slavery. And if the Bible was wrong about slavery, then it's got to be wrong about other things too. Well, Philemon is the Christian document dealing with slavery. Uh, and when you see what, what the spin is that Christians put on slavery, it is ceases to be slavery. And that accusation that uh, Christians are somehow unjust because we have permitted something as uh, inhuman as slavery, uh, that whole accusation just kind of loses its wind. So, take a look at the handout. Letter of Philemon is written by Paul while he's imprisoned. Um, the people involved, Onesimus, he is an escaped slave, and Philemon, he's the slave owner. So you'll see those two names come up repeatedly. That's who they are. Verses 1 through 3 in Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Apaphia, uh, Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the people he lists here, uh, he lists, first of all, uh, Paul, prisoner of Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. The prisoner thing, he's writing from prison. Timothy uh, probably served as Paul's amanuensis, which is a kind of secretary. Uh, Paul was legally blind. He very often required secretaries to do his writing, writing of his letters for him. Uh, you'll see in the first verses of a lot of Paul's letters mention of somebody else with him. That's usually his letter writer, his secretary, his amanuensis. So Timothy is serving in that capacity for the writing of Philemon. Um, he mentions other people here. Verse 2, beloved Apaphia. Uh, that's thought possibly to be uh, Philemon's wife. That's a feminine name. Uh, and Archippus, thought to possibly be Philemon's son. That's not known 100% if that's so or not. Uh, but they are faithful Christians. And Philemon is a Christian to the point that the church actually meets in his house. That's a big deal. Uh, that suggests Philemon was probably a man of, of some wealth. He had to have the house kind of in the congregation among the Christians big enough for everybody to meet in uh, and suited enough for, for a worship. Now, if you look at the structure of Roman houses, they very often had, a, had an open central part 
uh, roof around the outside, sun coming down in the middle. It was, a, it was a good place for people to gather. Chances are this guy was, um, uh, was Roman. All the names of his wife, his children, uh, Apaphia and Archippus, are, they're very Greek names, uh, Philemon II. Uh, so he's, he's undoubtedly a wealthy Roman citizen who converted to Christianity, and now they use his house. Uh, when Paul talks about his imprisonment on the handout there, just to get an idea, he will mention his imprisonment actually four times throughout the course of this 25-verse book. He was imprisoned in 54 A.D. in Ephesus. Uh, actually, uh, again then, in 56 to 58, it was two and a half years. 59 to 61 in Rome and 63 to 64 in Rome. He's actually imprisoned more than he was free during the last decade of his life. He spent a lot of time in prison. Uh, executed July 64 in Rome at the orders of Nero. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the fact that Paul lists all these people too, the fact that he's greeting the church and not just, hey, Philemon, uh, shows that he's putting the entire issue in front of the church. This is a personal issue between a slave and a slave owner. Uh, but Paul is making this an issue between the slave owner and the entire church. Everybody's going to see this discussion. This wasn't meant as a personal letter for Philemon. And everybody is going to see it because it carries importance for everybody. This, this, was, no, this, this was a big deal. Slavery in the first century was common practice. Uh, Christians had to understand how their treatment of slaves was something different than the world around them. So everybody gets to see this exchange and learn from it for themselves, too. There, there may have actually been slaves who were members of the church. Verses 4 through 7. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. What do these verses tell us about Philemon? He was a good Christian. He was active in his faith. He was not a Christian in name. He was not ashamed of his Christianity. He's someone that's mentioned repeatedly as sharing the faith. This is the kind of guy who talks about his Christianity to others, who wants others to be saved. Uh, verse 7 talks about him refreshed. Uh, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. So he's refreshing people. He's building Christians up. So he's a, he's a builder-upper, not a tearer-downer. There are, some, there are some within the church that seem to only be happy when they're tearing down something and complaining. And there are others in the church who are known to build up and strengthen. That's Philemon. He's a builder-upper. So he's a, he's a faithful Christian man, uh, a wealthy Christian man, a convert from the false gods of Rome. And he takes this very seriously. His faith means something. On the handout, faith and love go together. He's mentioned as loving, being known for his love. Uh, one cannot have one without the other. Love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It is an action directed toward others. It's an actual giving up of oneself so that others might gain. So Paul reminds Philemon of the nature of faith as love because what he's about to talk to him about will require faith and love to override Philemon's sense of right and justice. In many respects, our cultures are similar to what these people had. We, we live in a very litigious society, a very rights-oriented society. Uh, it's constantly, constantly uh, rubbed in the public's face about somebody's rights to do this or rights to do that. Um, that's not Christian talk. 
Uh, Christian talk gives up one's rights. That's the talk of unbelief, claiming your rights. Uh, he speaks of him also here in the, in the next section in very tender terms. Not only, not only was Philemon known as being a man of love, but Paul genuinely loved Philemon. Verses 8 through 10. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what's fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged and now also prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. If this issue was about rights, and, and, and the rights of Philemon were this. That one, he's a Roman citizen, which meant that anybody who wasn't a Roman citizen, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted to to them. Laws only applied to Roman citizens. If you were a slave in Rome, you were property. Nothing more. And your property owner could do anything he wanted to you. Um, rape was common. That, that's just standard practice. Uh, not, just the, not just the female slaves, the male slaves were raped by male owners. That was common. Um, so they were sexual property. Uh, they would be bought and sold. Not to say they were treated the same way that American slaves were, though. Uh, American slavery was race-driven and extraordinarily brutal. Slavery back in the first century, while it had the potential to be brutal, and while undoubtedly there were masters who were brutal, by and large was very different. It wasn't an enslavement just of a certain race. Uh, any conquered people were enslaved. And they had a tremendous amount of rights. Uh, not rights, wrong word. Tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, they very often were the shopkeepers. They were the laborers in factories. Uh, they were, uh, they were uh, accountants. Uh, you know, all, of the, all the kind of merchandise work, usually done by slaves. Uh, they, they invested a lot of trust in, in these slaves. They made them members of the household in some cases. But nonetheless, they were still property. They had no rights to claim of their own, no legal protections. They got a good master, they had it made. If they had a bad master, they had, they had no recourse. So Paul, in verse 8, actually says, look, if we're going to put this conversation in the realm of rights, that you have rights as a Roman citizen to exact vengeance on a runaway slave, I could claim rights too here in verse 8. You know, I might be bold in Christ to command you what is fitting. I'm an apostle for Pete's sakes. I brought you into this faith. I can just tell you what to do. That's my right. But I'm going to give up my rights. Yet for love's sake, verse 9, I appeal to you. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't want this to be a matter of rights. He wants it to be a matter of love. Uh, he calls him my son, uh, Onesimus. So that's, that's a beautiful thing, too, in verse 10. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus who might be gotten while in my chains. What do you think that means? Um, probably not in the sense of any kind of legal making him an actual son. Yeah, he's a son. And converted it, right. While he was in his chains, so while Paul was under arrest, somehow or another he runs into Onesimus and converts him to Christianity and now considers him his son in the faith. Now that's an amazing thing. He's, he's actually friends with Philemon and knows Philemon face to face. In Colossia, Paul is probably in Rome at the point of writing this letter. A considerable distance. Rome is a huge city, maybe a million people. For this runaway slave, probably runs to Rome to blend in with the masses and hide, somehow or another runs into Paul, who's imprisoned, and is converted. It's, a, it's an incredible story, and, and obviously the Holy Spirit is in there guiding this whole thing, because 
how else would this Onesimus guy just accidentally run into Paul, who knows his master, and then winds up adopting the faith of Paul? Um, and he's too is sincere in the faith, once converted. All right, verse 11. who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. So what does this suggest the slave-master relationship was like between Onesimus and Philemon to start with? Contentious. He's unprofitable, useless. Uh, Onesimus was a cruddy slave. Probably didn't like being a slave. I doubt I would either. Uh, and it was just, it was a useless relationship. Philemon fought with him. He fought with Philemon. Nothing got done. They hated each other. It, it was a bad situation. Um, why would Christianity, why would conversion to a faith suddenly make him not useless? His, his, his service becomes a chance for him to pass on the word. Yeah. It, the, the thing about Christianity, unique from anything else, any other, any other religion on earth, the, the unique thing about Christianity is it, it stamps the ordinary with a sense of holiness. That is, you want to be a good Christian, it's not a matter of you got to come to church more. It's not a matter of you got to go to more Bible classes, do more things, community service. You want to be a good Christian. Be faithful in the roles God has given you. Be true to the vocation you're called to. So if you're a farmer, be the best farmer you can be. It's, it's your service to God. It's your way of witnessing the word of God and the truth of the gospel. Just by being what God made you to be, to the best of your ability. You're a carpenter, be the best carpenter you can be. Be honest. Be trustworthy, follow through on jobs, do a good job. Uh, and, and if you're a slave, be a good slave. Listen to your master, do what's expected of you. you know, do it out of a willing heart, not begrudgingly, because that's a service to God. It's not just a service to a master. The thing about Christianity is it makes us see Christ in the other. We serve the other because... We're serving Christ. Uh, and there's this, this great passage that all of you know, but worth looking at anyway, Matthew 25, 40, in the parable that Jesus tells about an ungracious servant. Matthew 25, 40. Uh, start over at verse 34, in fact, of 25, and we'll read through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. See, that's the unique thing of Christianity. Just the basic service to humanity around us, just being the best we are in the, in the place we're at, for the sake of others, is, is, is a witness to Christ, a service to Christ. So Philemon will find Onesimus a very different kind of man now. And Paul knows this. He doesn't even have to explain it. He was useless before because he didn't see Christ in you. Now he does. And he's going to serve you for Christ's sake, not because I'm telling him to. 
Christ is in the other. Now, what makes this a real challenge is when we're supposed to see Christ in our enemies. Uh, it, it's you know, easy to serve family or people we love and see Christ in them. What about our enemies? That's when it becomes more challenging. And that's kind of the case here between Philemon and Onesimus. They were contentious. Paul is, Paul is telling him, see Christ in your enemy. Pastor? Yes? Slave, just being a Christian, giving up his rights to freedom and surrendered himself. Yeah, and that's exactly what's going to happen, right? Paul's going to send him right back into slavery. So yeah, in a way, he had kind of earned his freedom by running away, uh, but Paul's not having any of it. They're both going to be giving up their rights, and and really, that's. That's the model of Christian reconciliation, and that's, that's the other side of this. This isn't really just a story of slavery or not slavery. This is a story about Christian reconciliation. How do we find peace with people that we have a contentious relationship with? And Paul's solution is everybody's going to give up their rights, and everybody is going to be seeing Christ in the other. You will have a new relationship with the other in as much as you put away your pride and your ego and your sense of being hurt and see Christ in the other and serve Christ by serving the other, even your enemy. This is a beautiful model of Christian reconciliation. So verse 12. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart. So there it is. Onesimus now gives up his rights. He's getting sent right back into slavery by Paul. But not received as a slave. You therefore receive him, my own heart. Paul is sort of taking the role of Christ in a way. He doesn't tell Philemon outright, see Jesus in him. He says, see me in him. Treat this guy like you would treat me. He's my own heart. You know, as, as now as you do to him, you're doing to me, because he's my heart. Paul really puts this guy in the spot. But rightly so. He can do that. 13 to 14 whom I wished to keep with, with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I want to do nothing, that your good deed might be not by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. Paul is not just concerned with conformity. He does not come out as a legalist and say, do this, because God tells you to do it. This is all gospel. He wants Philemon's will to change, to want this, because it's what the Christian faith does. So I could, I could tell you to do this and force you to do it, but that's not what this is about. Without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might, might not be by compulsion, but voluntary. Uh, contrast that with a religion, say, like Islam, that cares nothing about voluntary and just demands by compulsion obedience. And even to the point of faith, you convert or I'll kill you. They don't care if your conversion is genuine or not. All they care is you mumble the words that you're going to follow Muhammad, and they're satisfied. Compulsion is just fine in their, in their worldview. This is, uh, this is something I came across this week in the box there. Um, we've got it. We've got such an easy life. What Christians are living through right now around the world is worse than what Christians had in first century Rome. Uh, but this is, this is how Islam works, and this man shows us a proper Christian response to it. A Christian man named Arif Youssef uh, Massa was arrested in Pakistan and put through horrific torture. Uh, they beat his hands until his fingers became swollen and they beat him over the head. 
the officer in charge, uh, Rana Gulzar, told the Christian man to convert to Islam, and Arif said, I have faith on my Lord Jesus. I will never change my faith. I will never be Muslim. Arif also said, my life is for Jesus. If they kill me and cut me into pieces, even then my life is only for Jesus. That's, that's faith. And by contrast, that's Islam. Conform or die. This man shows death. That is not Christianity and it's not Paul. All right, any thoughts or comments? 15 to 16. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul's expectations are extremely high. Now, he expects Philemon to put away his anger and accept this slave back, treating him not like a slave, but like a brother. And, and, and apparently a slave that may have very well robbed Philemon on the way out of the house. If you look down in verse 18, skip ahead, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. It suggests he does owe him something and did wrong him. He ripped off Philemon and ran away. Philemon has every right to be mad about this. But Paul wants him to take him back as if none of that happened and treat him like a brother, not a slave. This is reconciliation again. Being reconciled to one another is not a law. It's not about you got to do this. It's about consider your, own, consider your own standing before Christ. What have you done to Jesus? What have you done to God? A whole lifetime of disobedience. Uh, hurting him at a level no human being could ever hurt us. Uh, such horrible things we've done. Horrible things we've let come out of our mouth. You know, it, if, if we had done that to any one individual, they would hate us with a fiery hatred. We do that to God. And yet we come here into church and we expect he's just going to forget about it all. And that he's going to treat us like it didn't ever happen. In, in, in fact, that he's going to treat us like we're a child he actually loves. No hurt any human being has ever done to us is ever going to amount to the hurt we've done to God. And yet we come here with the full confidence that God isn't going to treat us like we deserve. That's what God wants us to have in mind when we deal with other people that we have contentions with. How we treat them is exactly how we're saying we want God to treat us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we want God to ignore us when we try and talk to him? Because that's what we do to people we don't really like. You know, they may say something, we'll kind of look the other way. Is that how we want God to forgive us? Paul very much wants Philemon to keep in mind his own debt to Christ so that he understands that Philemon's debt to him is insignificant. And Paul expects then that, that Philemon, regardless of the hurt, is going to be slave like a brother, not just welcome him back, welcome him back like he's a brother. It's, a, it's a, an incredible model of reconciliation. This is what it is to be a Christian. Doesn't matter what person has done against us. So the expectations of Paul are high because the expectations of Christ are high. And we don't do it for the sake of the other, we do it for the sake of of Christ who lives in the other. Verse 17. If you then count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. So Paul is acting like Christ to Philemon. He is he's actually becoming Philemon. 
When you look at Philemon, see me. This is, this is exactly what Jesus tells us about our neighbor. When you look at your neighbor, see me. So Paul is becoming his Christ to help Philemon. See me in that guy. Now he's going to become Christ for Onesimus, the next verse. But if he's wronged you or owes you anything, put it on my account. He's assuming Onesimus' sin. He has hurt you. He has taken from you. It's my responsibility now. My debt, I'll pay it. It's on me. You know, it's not on him anymore. It's, it's, it's a beautiful example of how to be Christ for others. Verse 19. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. It gets a little dig in there. I'm going to become Christ to Onesimus in that I'm assuming his debt. But just remember, I don't owe you anything. You owe me. <laughs> Uh, why, does, why does he owe Paul? Because Paul brought, brought Philemon to faith, just like he brought Onesimus to faith. And Philemon was a crass unbeliever at one time, too. So it's like, don't forget who you were. All right, verse 20, 21. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is a pretty high expectations. He mentioned in verse, what was it, 3? Uh, verse 7? Verse 7. He mentioned in verse 7 how Philemon is known for refreshing the saints, and so now he kind of calls that compliment back. Now your turn to refresh me, and you're going to refresh me by being a Christian to this guy who offended you. And Christians don't hold grudges. Let me have joy from you. Paul's joy is in seeing Philemon fully forgive and treat this runaway slave like a brother. And having confidence that you're going to do even more than I say. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's good fatherhood. That's good parenting. It's, it's not... A, <laughs> It's not, you're a failure and you're going to mess this up, but give it your best shot. It's get out there and do it because I, I, I know Christ is in you. You can, you can do this. Verse 22. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. I trust that through your prayers I, sh uh, I shall be granted to you. How's that going to shape Philemon's response? Prepare a guest room for me. How's that going to shape his response? Well, I'm going to come and check up on you and see how you're treating this slave, ex-slave. So Philemon's motivation is, I better do this. Yeah, and in, and in that sense, again, Paul's becoming as Christ because Christ has said the same thing. I'm, I'm going to come back. where You're going to see me face to face again. Um, so don't, don't neglect this. Uh, all things for us to keep in mind when it comes to our reconciliation with those who have offended us. And we all have people who have offended us and offended us deeply. Even them were to see Christ in. And that means if they say hi, we say hi back. And instead of going to the other side of the street when they walk by, we stay where we're at, we walk by, and we show them nice, that we're kind. We talk to them like human beings instead of ignore them because we don't like them. They are Christ, and as much as we do it to them, we're doing it to Christ. 23 to 25. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you. So evidently there was another Christian named Epaphras who was there with him in prison. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, 
my fellow laborers, you know, all, all Christian pastors, basically, who are trained by Paul. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So once more, at the very end of the letter, Paul puts this in the public sphere. Uh, Paul, Philemon's response is not just in front of his family, not just in front of the church there, but now it's in front of all these other teachers in the church. This isn't just a private issue. This is a church issue. And Paul makes sure that what happens here affects everybody and that everybody is cheering for what happens here. So this is how Christians hold one another up. They expect great things. Uh, not, not the law, not because that's what God says you have to do, but simply because we are Christ's and he lives in us and this is what Christ is about. This is what it is to be a Christian. So any thoughts, any comments, any questions on Philemon? Was Paul that optimistic that he was going to be released? Yeah, he probably was released from this. This is probably his first imprisonment. So he was probably of the opinion that, yeah, he was going to get out of this one. He was, um, he was imprisoned for short periods of time, relatively. I mean, a couple of years, he did it couple of years in a row type stints. Uh, it wasn't until the last one where I think he finally knew this was it. He was going to die at this imprisonment. Um, it was pretty much local officials that had him imprisoned. His last imprisonment will be by his appeal to Caesar, which of officially puts him under Roman uh, emperor's imprisonment, and there's no escape from that. So as soon as Paul appealed to Caesar at the end of his life, he knew he was going to die. Early in the Christian church, yeah. where, did, where did they come up with the simultaneously sinner saint? It's been part of Christianity from the beginning. Uh, the, the word we translate as saint literally in Greek means holy ones. So he's calling them holy ones. That's a saint. Um, it's not a dead person who's gone to heaven. It's just a Christian who's living their faith out. So, yeah, so Paul is calling them you holy ones. And the Christians have been doing that from the very beginning. Anything else? All right. Uh, write, if you would. Give some thought. Find a pen. If there's something that, that you'd like to discuss that we have not discussed something that's come up in your life recently, you want to take a time to put out in the open and work through, you know, write down a comment, we'll collect them, we'll see what we got, and maybe we can figure something out along those lines. There's no second letter in the New Testament that tells us. So it's assumed it went as Paul laid out, but no, there is no actual record of what happened from this. Evidently, the church in Colossia continued. Uh, I think if there would have been a major church tearing apart explosion, Acts probably would have talked about it, and it doesn't. So I, I assume things went as Paul laid out. All right, let's close with prayer. Gracious Father, as you reconcile those who are opposed to one another, we pray that you help us where we need to be reconciled with others. Remind us of the reconciliation you have worked on our behalf through the death of your Son. And grant us forgiveness and the ability to forgive for Jesus' sake. Amen.